Kelly? How are you doing? I figured since you are the only person with your, your screen up, I would say hi. It's, it's always a nice opportunity to, to chit chat before we get going uh, here. Most is, definitely. Is your first name Kelly or are you? Correct, that's my name. Where, where are you based out of Kelly? Uh, Washington State. Okay. Yep. I I'm always not, I, I never want to assume because else my first name would be affiliate according to my screen affiliate toolkit. So. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Uh, I work for uh, CrossFit for Vancouver and Adam Neifert. I'm sorry. Oop. I work for uh, CrossFit for Vancouver and Adam Neifert. Oop. Oh, is it? All right, you know what? Technical. Ditch the the earbuds. Okay. It's all good. I hear you fine. Uh, I work for CrossFit Fort, Fort Vancouver and Adam Neifer. Okay. Yeah. Well, and how long have you been with them for? Uh, I've been here since 2016. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on this call. I'm sure you're you're excited to hear Greg uh, put out a a process of uh, daily cleaning and maintenance of uh, Concept Two, right? Yeah, most definitely. I, I, I have a pretty uh, extensive one already I use, but that I came up with on my own, but I'm willing for anything. So that's yep, good. Yep. Well, we're going to hear from the, the muscle behind uh, concept two. <laughs> hey, Greg, how's it going? Good. Good. Thanks. Yeah. For Vancouver, they have probably got some machines that are a good 15 years old, probably, I would think. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we've got some, uh, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 million meter equipment. No, that's great. Well, is there any... great... oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say the great thing about herbs, they're, they're durable. I, I can recall my second affiliate buying like hand-me-downs from another gym. And uh, back at that time, I was like more reactive as opposed to having a, a very step-by-step -step process of, of cleaning them on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. But it's a... Uh, you know, we keep evolving and learning, right? So. Well, it is funny. Right before I came on here, an older gentleman who lives a couple of towns over in Vermont just brought over a 30-year-old rowing machine that he still uses three times a week, but he couldn't figure out how to change a, a monitor cable. So I told him how to do it for him. And funny enough, it's about the time when I first started working here. And uh, I almost thought that it was one that I had made myself, but unfortunately it was my coworker. So it, was, it wasn't actually mine. I would have gave him the warranty. <laughs> Well, you know, I guess I'll give uh, folks a couple more minutes while we continue to chit chat, but it is just tremendous how much resources you all have, Greg, on Concept2 for maintenance, troubleshooting. I mean, I really have to have the attention span to go down that rabbit hole, and I've traditionally delegated that to someone else to do, but um, it's always nice to bring together everyone and, and just kind of, quote unquote, dumb it down. And, and and spoon feed us. <laughs> so um, I mean, that's the nice thing. Is it's, right. it, it really is very simple, and they are meant to last with doing very little, but not as little as say like a kettlebell or something like that. So we tend to, you know, depending on the affiliates that I travel to, some of them, you know, you can tell they do weekly maintenance, and other affiliates, you know, they they kind of wait until something actually breaks, which is you know their their prerogative. But we do have everything online, and we're one of the few places you can call the 800 number you're going to get somebody here in the building and they're more than happy to walk people through you know the simple stuff so well with that said you know mm -hmm. i want to i value everyone's time thanks in advance for everyone jumping on this call we have about 250 people registered today so greg you're a popular man uh, <laughs> so but um thank you greg for for taking time out of your day to share with us some nuggets. And for those of you who haven't been introduced to Greg Hammond, he puts out a, a lot of great content, has been featured on a lot of the podcasts. Um, he's been part of Concept2 for 25 years, is it now? 27. Yeah. So, 27. Yeah. Um, so just imagine like he's the person behind, you know, the phone call of you trying to troubleshoot your earth, right? You know, now we have a, a face, uh, but really today's call, it, it, uh, and by the way, if you if I haven't connected with you, um, I'm Danielle Williams, I'm the Northeast rep, Northeast involving mid-Atlantic folks uh, up to Maine. But um, yes, it, it's great to meet you. 
Um, anyone on our rep team too, we're always resources. So if, if you need anything, don't be afraid to reach out to us directly. Um, I'm also going to be following up with you all passing along all the maintenance videos just in one email, whether you're delegating this to a manager um, or coaches, you'll have all the videos there pulled from the site that Greg was nice to, to organize for us. So uh, our objective today is just Craig's, Greg's going to present um, what he has planned, but we're really going to dive into the general cleaning and maintenance of the ERGs, as well as updating your monitors, uh, which is, is important and seat roller placement. And then also provide some time at the end, just keep it open and informal with some questions that you have. During the call too, if you have questions, please feel free to put them directly in the chat. If they're relevant and I can cut Greg off, I, I might interject Greg. Um, otherwise, Absolutely. we'll save them to the end. So um, I'm gonna pass the baton right to you, Greg. Okay, and like I said, this is, I mean, I'm sure you all know the basics of cleaning stuff. So I'll go a little bit deeper in and some of the things. and. I'll start out with saying that we're kind of a unique company in, in that we want our machines to last forever. Uh, we don't feel you need to buy a new machine. Uh, we have parts that are like little to no markup, you know, for these parts. We want them to keep going. Lucky for us, the two brothers that own the company, they don't believe in engineered obsolescence. Um, you know, a machine that's 30 years old is as accurate as a machine that was made today. Um, and so I just want to, you know, make that said and then also too is uh what you already mentioned is we have an infinite number of uh of uh, links and um and you know schematics and everything going back for every machine so no matter if you started your affiliate in 2008 or you started it last week depending on the era of your rower we have all that information we have all the old parts um everything on there um and also too like any questions just just spit them out um, you know, even if it's specific to you, chances are with this many people on the call, if you've got an issue with the machine, somebody else does too. And it is not just the rower. If, if it's the biker or the skier or something like that, if it's not something I can describe here, um, we'll arrange for you to call tomorrow or something like that, or I can email you some links and things like that. So, all right. So uh, I'll just start. So in case people aren't doing it, the biggest thing when I go to affiliates and I try to work out whenever I travel at local affiliates so I can see different things. One of the biggest uh, things I see is like just something as simple as dirty monorails, which if you're doing 10 cows or 500 meter sprint or something like that, a bumpy, dirty track is probably not a big deal, you know, um, but if you did you know once a week or you know, maybe twice a week, something as simple as a wet rag or, um, or something. So literally just, just wiping down, I try to hold it up on the monorail. So if your monorail doesn't look shiny silver, um, you probably should just for the enjoyment of your, of your clients or your, your members, and even yourself is, um, is going to be, and then it's just going to make it much easier. It won't be bumpy and things like that. Uh, what we suggest is a, a Windex, you know, watered down, simple green, any of your environmental, you know, cleaners, anything that you would use, you know, around the, around the gym, we'll work on that to take it off. If it's really bad, spray it, let it soak in and then just wipe it off with a rag. Um, on the seat roller itself on here, these white rollers, you can see those sometimes will get black marks that will stick to those. And then when you roll it, you'll hear like the bump bump, you'll feel it on there. Uh, you can do a wet rag and put it up against the seat rollers and roll it back and forth. Just being really careful you don't pinch your fingers. That's that's the big thing. Um, that's pretty much it for the for the for the monorail. It's pretty basic. What I will go into and I'll show you. Say uh, say somebody drops something on a seat, barbell, something like that. This is what the seat looks like when it's off the monorail. Just hold it up. So you've got your big seat rollers that go on the silver part on top and then you have these little seat rollers on the bottom that hold it onto the monorail. These can be replaced anytime and they're very expensive. I think they're less than seven dollars a piece and I'll just show you that one here. They'll come to you like this. All you need are simple tools to replace them. So if you have a 15 year old machine and you want to make it feel brand new, the cheap, cheapest and easiest way is to just get seat rollers 
uh, and replace them on your seat, clean the stainless steel track. It will feel like a day one brand new machine and your members will love you for it. It will be the, it'll be the most popular rower in your, in your affiliate if you did that. So again, these are the seat rollers. There's in the links, you'll see how to replace them. It literally is just, you know, a wrench and an Allen key and you can replace those, make it feel like brand new. As far as the machine itself, the front end of the machine, which I'll go on here, um, the chain we use, this product is called just three in one oil. It's uh, ubiquitous. You can get it at grocery stores, hardware stores, Home Depot, anywhere. Um, the big thing with oiling your chain on your machines is not using a lot of oil. Um, especially if it's a fairly new machine, say, you know, 10 years to eight years, it probably has that really shiny chain on it, which is actually nickel plated. So, you know, that's incredibly durable. You don't have to oil it maybe, you know, at once every three, four months. The older style chains weren't nickel plated and you had to do them a little bit more. Super simple. What you do is you just take a rag, you pull the chain all the way out. Most people don't realize the chain comes out really far. It comes out past the end of the monorail. If you have two people, it works great. One person holds the handle. The other person will take the rag and run it down the chain just to get any dust and grime that's on there. And then you take another rag, put on your three-in-one oil, put the oil on the rag, and then run it down the chain. So you never want to oil your chain directly because when you do put oil or drip it on or spray on like a bike chain lube, when you start rowing, it just starts flinging around the inside of the machine and just makes a mess, gets all over a bunch of other parts it doesn't need to. Um, I have a lot of friends that are mountain bikers and bike racers like, oh, I use my very expensive chain lube on the rower. That's just a waste of money. You don't, you don't need that. Um, our original oil literally was mineral oil like you would use on a massage table. I mean, there's nothing fancy. This is even more fancy than you need, but it works really good because it does have a bit of a solvent in there as well. So uh, we do sell it, but it's probably cheaper for you to just pick it up locally. Um, and this size bottle will probably last you several years and that's with several rolling machines. So just using a little bit. So that's it for the chain. Greg, can I interject for a second? Sure. How, you said it's good for a couple years and that kind of brings up, well, my, my head goes to what would you prescribe for their frequency or, or cadence at, at a, you know, I know affiliates use the rowers. It, it varies with uh, members and all, but just like a ballpark, what you would- I mean, if I was gonna, if I own my own affiliate, I would probably put on my calendar to do it once every two to three months. Um, and that's a busy affiliate on there. But then also if you live by the ocean, you know, or something like that where, you know, or, I mean, there's some affiliates that are in buildings with pools, you know, things like that, high humidity. You can do it anytime you want. It's not going to hurt it doing it too much, especially if you're wiping off the excess um, on there. So that, so, you know, if there's a question, just do it. But if it, if it goes, and I'm probably the worst at up. I've had my wrong machine for 15 years at my house in my basement, and I've probably done it three times, but it's still very smooth. So uh, it really is, you know, and like I said, a busy affiliate, two to three months is fine. If you are rowing and there's a symptom where it feels like it's skipping, uh, what that typically is, is that the links of the chain are stiff. They're not lubricated. And when it comes to the teeth on the cog, they're bumping up over the that. If you can tell where that is in the stroke and you add a little bit more oil and just work it in with your fingers, a lot of times you can loosen up um, stiff chains. And that's going to be the old chains. That's going to be the you know, the 2009, the 2009, uh, you know, 2010 type machines. Um, and maybe even before that, anything with, if, if people still have the old model C rowing machines or the model B rowing machines, um, that's where you're going to want to look for that more on there. So, um, just that okay. I'm not sure if I can even see, does anyone here on the call still have some of those model B, model C machines? If not, I'll just keep it up to the new, new, newer style Model Ds. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> you guys just met the, one of the founders' wives. Uh, that's Barry Drysdale. <laughs> she actually is one of the uh, the founders. Um, so the other thing I was going to get to is, and this is going to be symptom based. 
if your machine is good, but you've had it a long time and when you row, you tend to get a lot of chain slap, that bouncing of the chain could be one of two things. Poor rowing technique, which is very common, or the shot cord, the rowing, this actually bungee cord is what's inside the machine. And uh, uh, that's that's Josh. He's got also, if you call and have issues, you can talk to him. Um, so this shot cord is what returns the handle into the rowing machine. Um, and if you get that bouncing chain, chances are either this needs to be tightened or replaced. Um, the way you look at that on a, on a new machine is if it is a Model D, we went to something, it's actually this, this uh, it's like a bit of a dust cover. You slide this out at the bottom of the machine and that will expose everything that's on the inside. You probably can't see it all, but you don't really need to. We'll have schematics and there's also some videos online. This is that bungee cord I was just holding up. And then this is the chain. So this is the chain. This is the shock cord or bungee cord. And if it is loose, there's actually a tail end of that, of that shock cord, which is right here. You can actually pull through a little bit more shock cord, which will tighten the bungee cord and make it feel new again up into a point. If it's really old and you just, you've already tightened it a couple of times, it's probably time to replace it. And again, our parts are cheap. That shock cord is probably less than $7 uh, to make it feel like, like new again. Um, some of the other things I wanted to mention on here is handles. So, so this going to so these handles are about $15, I think. If your handles or your grips have just gotten really gross uh, or even maybe some of the rubber deteriorating on there, you can replace the handles with just two screws and put on new handles as well. So again, if you, you got a 10 to 15 year old machine, you clean the monorail, you change the seat rollers, maybe a shock cord and a handle, if somebody came down and rode that machine with their eyes closed, they wouldn't know how old the machine is. They would feel basically like, like brand new. Um, oh, I just saw that the shock cord. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say you necessarily need to do it very often. It's going to be really age dependent. How many, you know, millions of meters that you have on it. Um, and that's something else to mention. You know, some people check their monitor to see how many, meters they have a million meters is not a big deal on our machines and when we're talking 15 to 20 million now we're talking i mean there are people that do a million meters in a year and they do it consistently every year um you know it's it's um it's just the way that machines are built it doesn't you know the bearings are good it doesn't add a lot of strain to the machine on there um let me just see hey, too. Yeah. hey greg yeah uh, just real quick i was a little late to call. i might have missed it but uh, what do you do when you have that like weird, like that wobble? Like it feels like the wheel is, is, is wobbling. <laughs> so it's interesting. So when it left the factory, it most likely didn't have a wobble because they're all test road by, you know, a human. If it's something that came on eventually, what you would do is you would um, open up the flywheel enclosure. Is the machine that you have like the, this one we have, like the black, the newer style machine? Yeah, we just like refreshed everything so we just got like a whole new fleet of everything and uh okay like one of them maybe two have a little bit of a wobble on it what i would do and uh and i bet you i know since you've done that maintenance on them on the inside the flywheel there's an axle that goes through the flywheel and there's a nut on either side one is under that hub cap under the machine so let's show you on here so underneath this right here, you can see one of the nuts right there. And that goes through the machine and into the flywheel. If you over tighten those, when you put the flywheel back in, you're more likely gonna get a wobble on there. They're actually meant to be loose. So what we do in the factory here, when we build them, I can get this thing to come down here, is um, you wanna take your two wrenches, one on the inside by the flywheel, one on the outside, and you're gonna tighten it until you can't tighten it, not hard, and then you're gonna go back a quarter of a turn. 
if it's if it's too tight, any vibration is going to transfer into the machine. So by cracking it back off a quarter turn, it allows the flywheel to move a little bit without transferring that vibration into the machine. The other thing it could be is if you look at the fan blades on the flywheel, they're these little clips, they're weight clips. Because what we do is we actually, it's pretty high tech here. So blue not, we have to inertia test all the machines to make sure they're exact weight, their exact inertia. We punch holes in it and then we add clips to it just like you would a car tire to make sure that they're balanced. If you ever have an older machine and, and maybe you're moving them around a lot or even putting them in a truck and moving them around, sometimes those clips can either break off or fall off. There's like half gram and one gram clips. If you ever see like some jingle or hear some jingling and you open it up and you see a little piece of metal inside there, that's actually a balanced clip. If you have a, you can take a picture of it and you, send it to concept two, chances are whoever does get that email can tell by the picture what that is. And if you can tell which fan blade it came off of, because they do have some teeth on them, so it scratches the plastic, you could just clip another one back on um, to get it to be back balanced again. If it's really out of balance and you lost the clips and you don't know where they go, then you're probably looking at a new flywheel. Flywheels aren't, the, you know, they're not that cheap. They're about probably like 50, 60 bucks, I think, um, for a new flywheel. But we'll do everything we can to help you so you don't need a whole new one. We can try to do it some some different ways. But yeah, that the the wavering of the flywheel, they all move a little bit, but by turning those the nuts back on the axle, that'll give it room to kind of float a little bit. And then as as the person rowing it, you shouldn't be able to feel it on there. Hope that helped. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um the other thing that's going to be more cosmetic is, you know, I'm very aware in affiliates, you know, you're, you're, you're rolling them around a lot. You're taking them outside. You're going in and out of doorways and things like that. So one of the quick, easy way, inexpensive ways to make them look new again are caster wheels. Um, I mean, I don't think I've been to an affiliate that had all their caster wheels still on and intact. Um, so these are like four or five bucks. These are the rubber that go on the back of them. So, and they do just compression slip onto the feet. So if you were going to spend some money and up, you know, getting your machines to look new again, these are, are something that you can get. And again, they're, they're on our website, but I should mention not all of our parts on our website. Um, if they're not on there and you open up the link, which I'm going to send around to you guys, it has literally every part to make one of our machines in the schematics with part number. So if you call and talk to one of my coworkers and say you're having an issue and you go, I think I need this part. They'll ask you what the symptom is to make sure that you are going down the right path. And with that part number, you know, we can, we can order up anything, you know, we, we have them all here in house. we just ship out. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is before we get into the monitor stuff is whenever you're, you know, say you had to throw a machine into, um, into your truck to bring to another affiliate or to a, an outdoor event, like vibration, from either rolling them around a lot or putting them on a vehicle can actually loosen the screws, even though that they're um, they're usually, they're called patched. They have something on the threads. It won't do anything to the internal screws in the on the machine. Where it shows up is uh, where the front legs come down on the machine. So again, there's only eight screws, but you'll see on a machine here. If I can do this, there's there's like one here, and one here on the back side and then on the underside of the, of the um, front foot. So there's those eight screws. Those will become loose. If those get loose and they don't get tightened, the side effect of that is eventually one of those legs is probably gonna bend and break, okay? Again, I think they're less than 12 bucks, but if you wanna avoid that, when you're doing your cleaning and your maintenance, um, what I like to do is go through, put your foot on the, the bottom of the triangle on the foot there and just grab the flywheel and just give it a shuck. If it's, if it feels loose and it moves, it's well worth your time to, to tighten those, um, those screws. If you've ever seen me like at the games, I'll do that before every event at the games, just to make sure that the volunteers assemble them correctly, because that, you know, that's really important. That V triangle that holds up the front end is, is pretty, uh, pretty important. So taking time to, um, to check those, the other thing I was gonna talk about screws, the seat I was talking about, to get this seat off the monorail, 
all you do is take off the rear leg off the rower. So if you look at the back of your rowing machine, there's four screws that hold on the, the rear leg. You take those, those uh, screws out, and then this literally will just roll off the back of the, of the monorail, and then you just turn it over on the table, and then you can work on your rollers. It's very easy. Like none of this should be intimidating to anybody, you know, maybe the first time, um, but it's very simple. And if you need to call, we're more than happy to hold hands and talk people through it. Um, Cause once you do it, it's, it's super easy. Were there any questions on that stuff so far? I'm talking pretty fast. I just want to make sure everyone understands. No. Craig, I do have a question. Sure. Uh, it relates to the seat. I have a rower that, came out of the box and it had, it was very, the, the seat was very bumpy as you're moving along and you really notice it on long rows. I'm curious if I've cleaned the little track. I'm wondering if it's sort of a manufacturing defect or if I can actually take the seat off and do something that will help. Yeah. So if you don't actually physically feel or see anything on the seat roller, you like um, the way we do it, like when we used to be, when we were test rollers, if you take your fingernail and you hold it against the seat roller when you're rolling it and see if you feel like a dent or indentation on the seat roller itself, especially on this flange here on the outside, that will transfer the bump. Now, keep in mind to diagnose whether it's on the roller or on the rail, if you only feel it once when you go back and forth, it's going to be on the rail. If you hear, if it goes bump, 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 then it's going to be on the seat roller because every time the roller goes around, you're feeling that bump. So it really is how you feel the bump. Unfortunately, in affiliates, uh, there's barbells and kettlebells that get dropped a lot. If something falls on the monorail and dents the monorail, you're going to get that. And there's really nothing you can do about it unless you replace the rail. It's unfortunate, but it, I mean, it does happen. I mean, you can YouTube some videos from affiliates and you'll actually see stuff falling on the, on the rails. Um, so just diagnosing that, hopefully it's just on the seat roller and it could be something as, you know, as easy as you picking the off, something off that's stuck on it with your fingernail, or you just replace the, the seat roller, you know, and by all means, if you just got the machines and you have that problem, call up and we'll send you a new seat roller, you know, anything under warranty like that is, you know, will definitely help you guys out. So Hey, Greg, I got a question real quick. Um, sure. So I have recently had some some larger body athletes, 450, 500 pounds come. Is sure. there any way for us to reinforce the wheels on those seats? Um, they, they, they're they actually rated to well over a thousand. So you shouldn't have to reinforce the those at all. Um, we way back, if you remember the TV show, Biggest Loser, I yeah. went out there for the show a couple of times and we had several, not several, we had a couple 500 pound folks and, um, there's really no issue just for our safety standards. We have to test all these machines to, I think it's over 1500 pounds. So you shouldn't have to do anything. If it's an older machine and it feels rough when they use it, I mean, the bearings could be going in those seat rollers, the seat rollers themselves it might be hard to see with this in here, the bearings are pressed into this plastic piece. So, you know, if for some reason these bearings start to wear out, they're old, they're dried out. I mean, we're talking 10 years old. Okay. Then you're better off to just replace the, the seat rollers. But it's not, you don't have to okay. reinforce them in any way. Okay. No. no, that's that's good to know. That's refreshing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. So um, the other thing I was going to talk about, so monitor issues, you know, electronics are always you know, that's, I mean, building a machine that won't break is way easier than electronics. Um, CrossFit webinar. If you, um, if you guys have the old PM3 monitors, uh, you know, the ones that, okay, they look like this. There's like a little slot in the bottom for a card. I mean, we sold, I mean, I think for the most part, the majority of affiliates probably had more PM3s than PM5s, but they're getting pretty, outdated now and most people have upgraded to the the pm5s like that come on the machines now one of the things that i used to see when i go to affiliates is that there would be chalk and sweat jammed into the buttons and so they'd have buttons that would stick they would stick in uh or it just wouldn't function correctly so just like anything else we don't necessarily want you to have to buy a 180 dollars monitor if that's the case all of these can be opened up 
Okay, so they're all separated. And what is what you're going to see is that there's these rubber buttons that you're pressing here. And just by cleaning the chalk and the schmutz and junk and sweat and everything gets around the buttons, you can then clean it with like an isopropyl alcohol. You put this pad back in, you know, close it back up and, you know, you're going to be good to go. Also to um, people, you know, doing their 1Ks and they're like, oh my God, I'm so tired. And they throw the handle and it smashes the monitor and you get those, it looks like a black ink spot on your monitor. Um, you can replace just the LCD or just the glass and that will save you money from having to get a whole new monitor, okay? So, and that goes with the PM5s as well uh, on there. So again, just because, you know, it's broken, you don't always have to buy a brand new one unless you just choose to. Um, but we do see a lot of LCDs broken, you know, even if you're walking by a rower and you smack it hard enough, what you what that black mark is is actually the liquid crystal between the two pieces of glass that bleeds through on there um and so also too if you ever have an older machine and you might start seeing fading digits or lines in the monitor chances are just a new lcd is all you need you don't necessarily need a whole new monitor so it'll save you a ton of money i think it'll be 40 bucks versus 180 or something like that um it's all some other questions come in Okay, if it flickers, that's different. We saw a lot of this during COVID when people were spraying down monitors. Um, and unfortunately, or maybe we didn't get it across to people is that when you wipe down a monitor, you wanna spray a cloth and then wipe the monitor, not squirt it in the face um, because that liquid will go through and past the buttons and onto the circuit board and can actually corrode the circuit board. So, that takes a little bit more diagnosis on there as far as flickering goes. That's probably something I would say call concept two and ask for a monitor tech and they will, um, they'll kind of help you, you know, dive through it. Hopefully you can do it with a new, a new uh, LCD, but if you open your monitor and you actually see like powderish looking corrosion on the circuit boards, that's probably because cleaner got in there and, you know, did some damage in which case it's an opportunity to get a new monitor on there. Um, the PM5s are pretty bulletproof. We actually did a little bit better as far as trying to make them a little bit more water resistant than the old PM5 as far as getting in around it. This LCD screen is actually bonded to the face of this, whereas this, the face is its own, its own piece. Um, plus the PM5 is just a way better monitor all around, um, which is going to bring me to things like I don't know how we go here, use them in the affiliate. You might not use it that much, but anybody who likes to row, our ERG data app is free. Uh, it's online. It will pair to these. It will your, make it so your phone will talk to your monitor and will allow you to do a workout. And when you're done, all of your metrics, time, distance, speed, pace, watts, all that will get sh shot to an online logbook on our website, which automatically enters you into different challenges, you can win things, stuff like that. Um, but also too, if you're a nerd with numbers and you just want to progress your rowing and ERG scores, the ERG data app is the best way to do it because you can go back and sort by distance workouts, like all your 1Ks, your 2Ks, your 5Ks. Um, you can even sort it by intervals you might like to do, Tabatas, things like that. And although you can do them with the PM3, with a, our old log card, the PM5 is easy and it's just as easy to use your phone on there. And it is a free app, like I mentioned before. So the questions are coming through too fast. Was there, did I miss a couple of questions? I'm not sure. I'll bring them up. I think you addressed the benefit of the PM5 monitor that flickers. Um, Velvet had just put, could you speak about the purpose of the end cap at the end of the rail next to the library? Yep. Absolutely. So the end cap is basically cosmetic, but um, it looks bad if it's not on. And it's like for the new screw and plastic cap on the end, you're probably looking at for everything less than five dollars. Um, but it's not uh, it's nothing functional. The machine will work fine without an end cap. It just doesn't look good. And what if people don't know what he's what they're talking about is this right here. So. This piece, 
This screw right here goes through what looks like a hook that hooks over the axle that just basically holds on this end cap here. And I'm not sure how it happens, but I've been around a lot of places and they're missing. I don't know how or why, unless it's just from people storing them on their nose and they loosen up over time. Or I guess it's it could happen if you're moving these a lot, the vibration could loosen it up, in which case it comes off on there. Um, a lot of affiliates probably know, and, and we know, uh, most affiliates store these on end, like up on their nose with a monorail up in the air. But if you go on our website, you'll actually see we, we suggest that people don't do that. Um, mainly, not that it's going to hurt the machine, is that they're, they're, they're somewhat stable, but if a little kid was to bump into them, that rower will fall. And, um, and you know, there's, there's some sharp edges on it and things like that. But we do realize that people leave them up on their nose. Um, you know, it's, it's their affiliate. They can, can do what they want. I realize space is an issue, so that helps to put them up there. But one of the things you want to do before you put it up on end is to fold the monitor back. So, because if you have it in a, in the usable position where the monitors, you know, you're facing it, you're rowing, you go to put it away and it's still in that position, you tip it up, sometimes it'll go back and it hits so hard, it actually whacks the monitor. So, you know, I, I know it's hard. You can't get everyone, all of your members to do this sort of thing, but if you can kind of get them used to folding the monitor back, if it is really loose, tighten the screws that actually hit where it hinges and that will make it so it doesn't, even if they do put it up, chances of it coming down and whacking the monitor will be will be less uh, on there. And I mean, again, it's just gonna save you money, you know, in parts by doing like little stuff like this on there. Um, Greg, we, had, we had a question yeah. about wire replacement and uh, specifically a wire sensor error by Christine. Yep, good question. And it just so happens I brought one here. Um, that wasn't staged, by the way, I just thought I'd have it. So, um, most of the time, I would say 80% of the time, if you get a sensor wire error message, there's nothing wrong. This plug has just come loose. So the first thing you do is unplug it and plug it back in and see if the error goes away. Most times it will. On the very end of this, what looks like an earphone jack for the old earphones before we had earbuds, uh, there's actually two little clips on there and you want them both to be in completely. If it's not, the monitor is going to give you that warning on there. So anytime you see that sensor wire, pull it out of the monitor, plug it back in, chances are it goes away. If this wire and you look at it is kinked in any way or you see any copper coming through the insulation, then you're going to need this whole thing. And what this is, is this is the part, if you look at your flywheel, there's a little plastic cover on there. And I'll show you on here. Uh, so, oh, I don't know here. so here's your flywheel. Here's your, uh, this black plastic cover. If, and there's two screws on top. If you undo those screws, what you're gonna be looking at is literally this coil, okay? And in this coil, there's these two magnets right here. This is what reads the flywheel magnets that are on the flywheel. So, that's how simple these are. Basically, this is reading how many times this in these embedded magnets on the, we call it a magnet ring that's on the flywheel goes by. It sends it through this wire and up in the monitor and all the magic and the math and all the equations that we use to make them super accurate are all in the monitor. This is literally just a way to, well, two things. It's doing that, but it's also uh, generating power. So what people don't usually realize is that when you're rowing, you're not using the batteries in the monitor. Matter of fact, the new machines, you can take the batteries out and start rowing and the monitor will come on, okay? If you're rowing significant, you know, at a decent pace, like a two minute split or something like that, or even maybe a little bit less. So ever since we came up with the Model Ds, which are the ones that look like the ones behind me, um, they're actually generating power from the magnets um, so that it will, it will run on its own. The batteries that are in the monitor are there for when no one's rowing and you want the monitor to stay on on there. So, but yeah, this is a sensor coil. This is what they'll send you. Um, to replace one of these on a modern machine, we're talking 10 minutes and a Phillips screwdriver. That's all you really need. So, um, 
trying to think if there's anything else as far as monitor questions. Anything else come up? Come up there. All right. The um, the only thing I was going to bring up too is that you might know that um, we have challenges monthly, and I know I like Champlain Valley CrossFit where I train here in Vermont. You know. Um, they've done stuff where it's like erg only days or, uh, you know, an erg track where you can just kind of go through and, um, and do just erging, you know, like maybe on Thursdays or something. When you do that, you can find it online, but we actually have, it's our, we have a, a whole challenge calendar for the year. And like, I was looking at it for May, that's our marathon and century challenge. So as a fun little added benefit thing, you know, if you want to do it with your members, you say, okay. How many people here have done a half marathon? Most people think you're nuts, but it's really not that bad. Um, when we did the games of the year, when we did the half marathon or 2K into a half marathon where Khalifa kicked butt way back in the day, that sparked a lot of people to do it. And then when we did the full marathon, it's amazing how many affiliates did that as like a, an event in their affiliate. If your members do that, and especially if they use ERG data, they'll get certificates uh, from us, you know, acknowledging that they did their first marathon and the date and all that stuff. So that's like a, a free thing you can do with your members. If you want to build them up to a marathon, it can be kind of fun. Um, the century is for the biker. You're not going to do a hundred thousand on the row or and let, well, I mean, people do, I, I wouldn't do it, but um, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that you can kind of add some um, at no cost, a little bit more, you know, value to the, to the training and stuff with the ergs and, and we actually do the, the prizes and stuff like that, certificates. There was another, oh, holiday challenge is the other. It's our most popular one. And that's between Thanksgiving and Christmas. If you get your members to commit to either 100,000 meters or 200,000 meters uh, during that, that time frame, um, they'll actually get certificates and things like that after. When, at least a lot of affiliates that I know, they'll do that on top of their workout. So what they'll do is they'll do their normal wad. And then either they go to the back room or they pull the machines down and they just do, you know, five or 10 K after class. And it's amazing. You can eat and drink all you want over the holidays. You'll never gain weight. If you just do your wads and then do the challenge and it's good to go. Um, so that's a fun one, but there literally are challenges at least one, sometimes two or three per month on our, on our site. So, and we can help you with, with anything, you know, as far as like organizing some of that stuff. Greg, just to backtrack, I had two more questions. Sure. One is with storage relating to the handles of the cradle along and, and releasing that. Could you yes. just <laughs> no, it's funny. That's um that's a question that we've been getting for probably 50 years since we've been around. So the old model A's and B's, if you don't know, um the model A had the bicycle wheel with the plastic cards in it. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And then we had the Model B, which is an open flywheel enclosure. You can see this big aluminum flywheel, but all the bungee cords and the chains were in the monorail itself. Okay. And so back then, this is, we're talking 80s, you know, in the 80s, uh, is they wanted you to take the handle out because it took tension off the shock cord. Anything since the Model C, which would have been, you know, 90, probably 95 to now. You don't have to. You don't have to take it out of that handle hook on there. There's not enough tension on the shock cords to to make it go. But if you ever talk to anybody who rode in college, they're <laughs> like, I mean, they are sticklers. They're like, oh, you never leave the handle in the handle hook. Um, but we're less, you know, stubborn about it. You don't need to. It's fine if you do. Uh, but what we found is that if you don't put in the handle hook, and someone maybe a new member who's less flexible, tight hamstrings, they get in, they strap their feet in, and then they can't reach the handle. And so they got to take their feet out and they go back in. So it's really personal preference, but as far as machine goes and uh, damage to the machine in any way, you can leave the handle wherever, wherever you want on there. Um, that was the other thing I wanted to <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I want to mention is foot straps. So, I just was, we were at HWPO for their big event for the open. And we discussed this. Um, if you ever had a member that comes up and said, Hey, my foot straps loosen up when I row. Yes. The foot straps could need to be replaced, but chances are what they're doing is they're pulling themselves up to the catch using their feet. And it's a rowing technique thing. If it, if it, and you can watch it, if you watch some of your members row, 
And when they go to come forward on the stroke, watch their feet. If their feet come up and they're pulling on their foot straps in order to bring their body forward, um, that can be fixed and it's not the foot straps. Um, the best way to correct that, and we do it a lot with a lot of people, is strapless rowing. So basically take your feet out of the straps, put them on the foot stretchers, and then have them start to row easily, being careful they don't roll off the back. But even the best rowers in the world, Olympic rowers, they can row at pace, you know, sub 130, 120s without being strapped in. And it's because you want to do, and now we're getting into some technique stuff, but, you know, it's hands away, hips forward, and it's the swing of the body that makes you come forward. It's not pulling with your feet. And so that's, um, if you do watch any of our technique videos, you can kind of break it down. Once you see it, you can spot it everywhere. Um, and if we ever want to do another call on technique, we can always set that up as well. Um, I know on top of everything else the affiliate owners have to do, doing rowing only specific training is not a lot of time for that. But as you know, we'll, we'll train Olympic lifting all the time. There's very few people that will actually train on the rowing machine. But when it comes to things like the open, you know, or any competitions, you know, being good on our ergs is very helpful. <laughs> so, um, other questions. There was one about the um, the battery um, monitor, and it says, "Is there a way to fix the battery cover where the screw rod that goes through won't screw in?" Yeah. So if you over tighten the the screw, what they're talking about is right here. This this is a I think they just call it a thumb nut, thumb screw. Um, the threads themselves uh, will cut into the plastic, and if you over tighten them, they'll actually pull the plastic out. You can buy just the back case, uh, which isn't expensive. And then you would just transfer over your LCD and all that, and you can put it back here. I've had some people have good luck by putting um, a type of like Elmer's glue or a wood glue in the hole, let it start to set up a little bit, put this back in, it will recut the threads, and then you'll be good to go. Um, it's, uh, it's like I said, you can make it a permanent fix, get a new uh monitor back to do the problem you can try i mean you got nothing to lose right before you buy one try the glue trick um or you know a lot of times black electrical tape just keeping it on there the batteries aren't going to come loose or fall out or anything like that but if you want to make it like new again probably the cheapest way and again it's you know a couple bucks for a new uh case back on there um but the, any of either of those will work and it, it really just comes from over tightening that screw on there so. Um, while we're on still cleaning, uh, Marty had a question on cleaning the flywheel. Uh, what would you suggest for this? Yeah, so cleaning the flywheel, depending on where your affiliate is and how dusty it is, or, you know, if it's if your garage doors are open and you're getting a lot of like road dust or, you know, if say you have, um, you know, affiliate animals, dogs, things like that around, which, you know, a lot of us do, um, you'll start to see, because of course, when you're rowing, the air gets sucked in into here and gets blown out the this part right here. So if you look at that screen and you start to see dust or dog hair or things like that coming out of the screen, it's probably time to clean it. Um, we have a good video on our website on how to do it. it. It seems like it's confusing, but it's not. You're basically gonna loosen up the four screws around the flywheel, that silver, belt that goes around that has the holes in it if you look around it you're going to see another screw and that's almost like a belt buckle if you lo loosen that screw you can pull that whole thing out and just wipe it down and clean it if it's really bad on the inside of the flywheel then a vacuum cleaner will just vacuum it out now people ask about accuracy like oh i have a dirty machine it's not as accurate as a new machine that's not true if you have a clogged perf uh perf is that silver screen i was talking about all it means is that if you had on a new machine, if you like to row at a drag factor of say like a 117, which would be like on a new machine, like a three or a four damper setting, all it would mean is that you'd run it a little bit higher because the air is not flowing as easily, but it's still just as accurate. You might just not use the same damper number that you normally would use, but if you want to keep them new and, and great, then yeah, you want to clean your flywheel when you start to see that build up in the, on the screen in there. So, um, Greg, kind of circling back to community engagement, Tyler yeah. had a question 
about how complex or difficult it is to link everyone up on a screen where everyone could race like they did in the games. And yeah, then, it's, uh, it's free. We have it. It's called Erg Race, and you can download it onto a laptop from uh, from our website. And all the directions for Erg Race are on there. All you need are Ethernet cables, which are cheap. You get them on Amazon. Just figure out how much distance you want between each machine. And if you notice on the back of the PM5, there are these two little Ethernet ports right here. I don't know if you can see it or not there. Um, and all they are is what they call daisy chain. So, you know, cord comes out of erg number one, goes into erg number two. The other hole that's on erg number two goes to erg number three, blah, 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 all the way down, and it ends with your laptop. Um, I would say, I would say, you know, download it and do it every once in a while, like a Saturday morning or Sunday morning, you know, have a little mini race or a lot of times fundraisers. It's great for that. Once it's in your laptop and you can set up all your racing and you're, you can name everybody in your lanes out the other side of your laptop, you would just go to your HDMI or whatever you want. And you could go to a, a big screen or something. Believe it or not, it's the same software we use at the games. You could use in your affiliate. Um, it's, it's no difference. Um, we've done some custom builds for like Waterpalooza and things like that for specific events. But if you're just going to do things like, uh, you know, a, a 2k row, 1k row standard distances for speed, or it does some pretty cool things too, where you can actually go row rowing machine number one and number two, you have two people on them, but their power input goes to one boat. So as if you were racing a two person boat. So if you have somebody who's doing like a, 150 split and someone's doing a 210 split their boat speed is going to be like a two minute split on there so they just averages out the boats so you can have some really fun team workouts that way too so yeah it's um and this is stuff we've had for years it's just you know people don't realize it and you know maybe we don't do a great job getting that out to people but that's all free on the website and it's actually called erg race and we are working on some wireless racing that you can do you know, so over the internet. So, you know, hopefully within a year or two, probably more like a year, if say there was an affiliate in Spain and you wanted to work out a race between your affiliate and the sister affiliate, then you could do that on there and you could see each other. A lot of it has the, the downside, why it's not ready yet is internet speed. So unfortunately, if you're in the middle of a race and internet acts up, it's pretty frustrating if things go down. So we're trying to figure out ways around that, so. That's great. I mean, over the years, I, my affiliate, we always did the holiday erg challenge. It's like perfect timing to really get everyone jazzed. And what we found was it just, it caused so many great interactions among members without having that class structure. So if you have a setup that's conducive to it, I remember you guys used to give out towels for that. We would get a shipment of towels for whoever had reached their goal. So, um, we We've done a lot of stuff that's really fun. And so the other thing to do is if you have a map, say you just throw a map on the wall and you and you put a mark out some destinations and you do stuff like where it used to be a kid's game, actually, and it would go around Lake Champlain, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And so they get on, they row so much just to get to the next point. And then you see if you can make it all, all the way around, you know, things like that. There's a lot of fun things you can do, especially with like CrossFit Kids stuff. Um, use the machines. Of course, we have the fish game on the monitor, which if people haven't tried, then you try the fish game, dark games, things like that. Um, yeah, it's there's just a, a ton of stuff it can do. And again, if you don't have time to go through our whole website, just call. I mean, everyone on our phone team here is super cool and they all know CrossFit. A lot of them, we do CrossFit here uh, with classes too. So they, they know the sport, they know terminology and wads and all that stuff. So and to make everyone aware too, and, and you can answer this question I have, Greg, um, I subscribe somewhere along the lines to your daily workout of the day concept too. It's awesome. I, I draw inspiration for that for my own training um, in my affiliate. So um, where could people go to subscribe to that? They'll go right to our website. And if you go to the online logbook, which you would set up, um, there's a link that you can be on our, our newsletter, but you can also sign up for the workout of the day. So I mean, the easiest thing for probably go to the concept2.com, go to the search window and just put workout of day and it'll take you right there. Um, now on Erg Data, and I was just testing this out today. So there's also share a workout. So like, I don't know if there's a buzz about VO2 max training and what they call the Norwegian four by four, you know, four minutes on, three minutes off, four minutes on, four times. And so I did that and on, I programmed it. It was in my Erg Data. And I have a friend in the UK who 
our office over there. I'm like, you should try this. I literally took my workout on Eric Data and I sent it to him and it comes to him in a link. All he has to do on his phone, if it's paired to the PM5, is open that link and his monitor is automatically set for the intervals that I just did. So he doesn't have to do a million button pushes to do it. So that's a new feature. The share workout is, is actually really cool. So if you want to taunt your friends with workouts, you can you know berate them with links to workouts that you program so they don't have to and things like that. That's great. Um, I have one more question on from Tyler about seminars. And Tyler, are you speaking to seminars being done by Concept2, like what educational opportunities they have or CrossFit HQ? Uh, really okay. either. Um, I think just like a, you know, like we have weightlifting seminars all over the place. Um, and I know like Dark Horse used to do one uh, and things like that. But I think um, if it does exist, I don't know about it. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for in-person um, education like that. I know there's some online ones, but yeah. And so, with the, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and now you have ski ergs and bike ergs more prevalent. Um, and like, I feel like you could, I mean, there could be an entire day or two of education around all three pieces. You're absolutely right. And actually I found that out at HWPO too. It's like, I forget that not everybody's tried the ski erg or knew anybody that skied, you know, we forget up here in Vermont that skiing is not a normal thing for majority of the U S. So, um, I agree with you hundred uh, percent. As far as the rowing certs go, we did have CrossFit rowing back when we had a little bit more robust, you know, stuff going on. And that was Shane Farmer that would do that. And now he's dark horse rowing. He's really good. And we do send people to, to Shane, um, Lizzie Carson, uh, on in New York and, um, the, those guys, the Carsons, they're on our website now. You can hire them to do if you're in the New York area or something like that for you know for seminars. Um, there's a group called You Can Row Two out of um, out of uh, Minnesota. They have some certification courses. What's nice nowadays, you can actually do these courses and they can be online where you actually you do the whole you know book work and stuff. You actually row. You try to implement what you learned and send the video to them, and they will critique your rowing and kind of dial you into where you need to be um, to different levels. Shane can definitely do the skier as well. Carson's can do skier as well, um, but it is still fairly new. And, um, you know, we do need to do that a little bit more. There's still some pretty funky skier technique out there. It's gotten a lot better from the, than, you know, 10 years ago when the skier first came out, we don't see a lot of like the odd butterflying and things like that as much at the elite level, but we still definitely see it in the affiliate level. Um, so you're right. We do, we need to do more. And, um, like I said, if you guys ever want to do something like this, I can easily set this up in the workout room and we can do something like this on technique as, as well. If you guys ever, ever want to, um, I thought I saw something on there about a biker, but I didn't, it went by me too quick. I didn't see it. I don't know if someone's still there. Yeah, Marty had a question about bike. Um, Marty. Was yeah. That yeah, so I have um I have several of your bikes, and yep. I noticed that the older ones on the, the pedal crank, there's only one pinch bolt, and the new ones have two pinch bolts. I, um, my older ones, I have a couple of them that the with the single bolt that it's getting stripped out, and that crank gets loose. Yeah, if it gets loose, call us, call us up, ask for a tech, and um, you can convert to the two bolt system. <clears throat> The two bolt is definitely better, but like my biker got home, I have a single bolt. And like when they first came out with a single bolt, it really wasn't an issue. I'm not we weren't really sure what what the issue was, but then we switched to that two bolt just to make sure that it's not going anywhere. Um, so if yours is loosening up and you can't keep or don't want to keep tightening it or you're stripping it out with a single bolt, then just call and you can get a kit where you can switch to the two bolt. Um, I'd say if there was like three levels of difficulty, it's probably a level two. Um, it's not, it's, it's more than cleaning the flywheel on a rower. It's not so bad as, you know, changing like traveling pulleys and things like that in a rower. So um, it's worth, it's worth doing if, if when you pedal on it, you feel that wiggling in the pedal, which is just super annoying. So. Yeah. And that's what it is. I, I've changed the bolt out three times. It's only on one bike and it's only on one side. Um, and that's it. It just keeps getting annoying. Yeah, just just give a call. Like I said, just ask for, you know, you can even say a biker tech. The guys are good. Um, 
the guy who came in, Josh, that uh, came in with the, the founders. Wife, he's actually like, uh, he's a biker whisperer. He's pretty good. And a guy named Nathan that's here. They're, they're just really good on the bikes. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I would say, I'd say get it, get it fixed. If it's one of the original, original bikes. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We got time for one more question. And sure. this is about the bike. Um, and Kelly was asking anything repairable on the inside of the lower bike portion. She's getting an internal squeak. Yeah, 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 that same thing. So the bikes, if you turn them upside down, you know, seat and handlebar on the ground, so completely upside down, there's actually a panel that closes off the bottom of the box of the, of the biker, and you can take that open, and you can kind of look inside and see what's in there. Essentially, it's it's two belts, um, automotive-grade belts. So these things are built for way more than what we're going to use on this bike, you know, because they're meant for automotive stuff. But sometimes that rubber can squeak on there. And, um, you know, if you again, if you call and talk to the biker guys, they'll let you know. They really like to if you're going to email it in with a bike thing, they love it. If you can send them a video that can pick up the sound along with where your pedals are when you're pedaling. So the more info you can send them, the better, because in our minds, we know what it looks like inside. Based on the frequency of the squeak, we can tell which pulley it's going over because of the size of the pulley on there. So um, again, that's the best thing. So if you do have a biker issue and you want to email a video in, it's info at concept2.com. And again, if you can get it to where someone's pedaling and you can get your phone close enough to hear the squeak and where it is in, in relation to the person pedaling, super helpful. And the guys will just walk you through it on there. Okay. Well, for the sake of time, we're at 3.30. So if any of you have other questions, I will make sure that you're directly in touch with Greg and get you a, a recap of this, as well as a video recording. At some point, I was just taking notes furiously. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you all found this uh, valuable. I'm going to work on collaborating, or our, our rep team's going to work on collaborating with Greg on a future call about technique if you guys are interested. If you have any other rabbit holes that you want to explore, uh, Greg has volunteered his time. <laughs> no, he's um, uh, already said there's so many topics to, to go through as we were organizing. So please send them that my way uh, yeah. in response to the email because we, we certainly want to be here to help you all out. And um, yeah, and, and thanks Greg again for your time. So. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, if any uh, questions, you know, like I said, if you can get their questions or ideas they might have about doing more of these, unfortunately, where I see most of the affiliate owners is going to be the games uh, or a semifinal. And I'm usually running around with my head cut off. And so I can't give everyone enough time to answer all their questions. So, you know, we can do that in advance. And then also, too, if you ever do see me at the games or the events, you know, I'm usually the guy in the concept too shirt, sure, you know make sure you stop and, and say hi. And you know, I really do like hearing what the affiliate owners are have to deal with with our equipment anyways, so. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone. Greg, I think this would also, it, it would be interesting, like especially if you're an owner preparing for holding a licensed event or any event, you know, what's your protocol for checking errors? We have more than enough here, but I think that would be, a really good opportunity to hone in on making sure you got all your, you know, it, it's very bad. So if you're hosting an event or you just want to, it's, I, I check the, the fasteners and make sure everything's tight. I check the battery level in the monitor. So if it's anything, if it's a major event, if it's anything below 50%, I swap the batteries out uh, just for the head, just, just for the sake of it, just for my own, make myself feel good on there. And then um, I usually will test pull every machine to a significant split, say like a 130 or 135 split, um, depending on the workout, if it's anything over like a 10 cal or, you know, 250 meters, that's going to be fine on there. It's um, the shorter the sprint, the more intense and the bigger people in your affiliate, that's where you start having issues, you know, like at the games, if it's a short sprint, I get nervous. If it's a uh, 5k or anything longer, the, the the amount of force they're printing in the machines is much less because they're pacing themselves. And so that's always a little easier to, to deal with. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, guys, I'll be circling back with you all. Thanks again and, and have a great rest of your day.
Thanks for the time, everybody. Bye.